evening. Thank you to all the panelists. Thank you to Dr. West. It's an honor to be here uh, with so many conscious-minded folks all across the country. We live in very difficult times. The last four months for us as the Muslim community, as the Arab community, and just the general community, anyone with a conscience, we're living in difficult times. We have not ever seen such a documented genocide take place ever in our life, where every single moment we're seeing people spread the last moments of their life on video. You see, you hear the message, you hear them crying, you hear these, you watch the videos on TikTok on a daily basis. People's real lives are being documented, and there's no other side to the story. It's very clear what's happening. 30,000 lives have been lost. 70% uh, of the infrastructure in Gaza has been destroyed. And we're in a time where we, as a community, need to seriously think about where politics is headed. How can we begin to build power? And we live in difficult times. We see two evils that are clear, clearly out there. And we ask ourselves, well, which one's the lesser of the two evils? When in reality, we should be asking ourselves, where do we want to head? And that's the whole point of Muslim Visionaries. It's about having a vision for the future. It's about how we can build power and organize as a community because we want to have long-term change. We don't want to just think about what we're doing today or tomorrow. It's about building a vision for the future where we're able to, first of all, free Palestine, but free people that are suffering all over. And we have a justice-oriented mindset. And when you're in difficult times and you're trying to understand yourself and understand society, the people that guide us in all times are of two or maybe one and the same. They're the educators and the philosophers. All ancient wisdom will consistently tell us and teach us that when we're in difficult times, go to the philosophers because the philosophers will give us insight into what the future will look like. And thank God we have someone conscious who's been working in this space for, I don't even know, six decades, five decades, and, being a, and has been a conscious voice for the truth on this issue since the very beginning. And I don't have anything else left to say besides I want to bring up Dr. Cornell West to give us his insight. My dear brother, I want to thank you for those kind words. And it's a blessing to set eyes on you once again. We had a wonderful time in LA, another wonderful time at Orange County. Of course, I want to always salute Sister Madeline and Sister Kiana two visionary and courageous leaders I'm very, very blessed to work with. My prayers are always for his brother Edwin. He has a precious little daughter, Valerie. She's only a few weeks old. I mean, Benicio, well, Valerie's his wife, who gave birth to Benicio, the son. But he's only two weeks old, so we want to keep him in our thoughts and prayers, all three of them. But I want to thank each and every one of you for taking this time out. This is, this. I think it's so crucial because we live in such a pivotal moment in history. We, the level of barbarity, I would say bestiality, but that's being too kind to the beast. Lions and tigers and others don't engage in the kind of gratuitous violence that we see right now in Gaza. And we know there's the history of genocide throughout the history of the species. But as my dear brother said, to see it before our very eyes ought to awaken in us larger visions of integrity and honesty and courage, larger visions of what it means for people to actually have their dignity affirmed rather than violated, their humanity affirmed rather than called into question. That I come from a black folk who've known, we've been on intimate terms with being terrorized, intimate terms with being traumatized, intimate terms of being hated. And so, when I reflect on what has gone into me, what has been poured into me by the folk that love me, I'm talking about Irene and Cliff, Shiloh Baptist Church, Black Panther Party, Martin King, Malcolm X, Ida B. Wells. I can go on and on and on back to Sojourner Truth and Harriet Tubman. These are not just names. These are love warriors of the highest level and freedom fighters of the highest level wounded healers of the highest level. Now, it's very kind of you, Brother Boss, mentioned me being a philosopher, philosophia, lover of wisdom. Now, if you can have a lover of wisdom who's also a warrior of love and justice, then you got a combination, you see. And that's very much what I've always aspired to. You know, how do you link the life of the mind and life of spirit and the life of struggle that's grounded in a love and justice. And I come out of a revolutionary Christian tradition through Shiloh Baptist Church and Reverend King and Fannie Lou Hamer, meaning what? 
meaning that you really begin with spreading that loving kindness, spreading that hesed in Hebrew scripture to orphan and widow, the fatherless and motherless, the subjugated and persecuted and degraded and desecrated. So that the oppressed folk do have a priority, the least of these in the 25th chapter of Matthew, what you do to the prisoners, to those in the hood, the reservation, to those who are being under those under occupation domination, no matter who they are, all human beings made in the image and likeness of, a, of an Almighty God. But that's my particular tradition. Now I got a lot of comrades who are Buddhists, like bell hooks. I got comrades who are who are Jewish. I've got comrades who are Muslims. I have comrades who are Hindus and so forth. But all of us can come together on a common ground. I got a lot of secular brothers and sisters who I love very deeply. But we still come together on what? Quest for truth, justice, and love, compassion, care, concern for others. And it's very sad to see the genocide in real time and the, the cowardliness of so many of our politicians, the cowardliness of so many of our leaders, so many of our religious spokespersons, they running around scared, intimidated, afraid of speaking the truth. And at this particular moment, if you can't speak an, an unequivocal truth that connects what's going on in Gaza, what, what goes on here in Harlem, I'm looking at Harlem right now on 123rd Street where I live, our south side of Chicago or East LA with Latinos or poor white brothers and sisters in Appalachia or immigrants on the border who's still being dehumanized day in and day out and being scapegoated day in and day out. Or workers, I just met with brother Chris Smalls, workers who are being pushed aside, trying to come to terms with Amazon. We can go on and on and on. That I am simply running based on a call that I received 55, 60 years ago, which is simply to be true to a quest for truth, justice, and love. And it spills over now in electoral politics, but I've been trying to do it for 55 years in the classroom, in the cell, in the jail, on the corner, church, mosque, temple. And I'm a hang loose kind of Christian, so I spend time in the nightclub too. So I've been trying to do it in the nightclub with the music. Appreciate most death. Most death, my dear, dear brother. And we've been able to spend some good time together. I know his mother passed it called him up and uh, we had prayer together. He was in South Africa at the time. He's a Muslim brother. I love that brother intensely. But most importantly, I try to embrace my witness, embrace my work with humanity at its deepest level, but very mindful of just how cold and cruel the world can be. And that's what we're seeing in, seeing in Gaza. Now it's true, you know, Sudan, and we've got, we've got all kind of, atrocities going on around the world. But right now, for me, the real litmus test of any serious leadership is telling the truth about our precious Palestinian brothers and sisters undergoing this genocidal assault and ethnic cleansing, living under apartheid, and yet still can't get most of our politicians to say a mumbling word, let alone those running for president for the most part. Let me stop there. I don't want to go on and on here, though. But uh, it was that enough time. Uh, I didn't go too too long or too short. But... I think you got you got you got all, you you still got a good amount of time, Doctor West. You can oh, keep I still going. got more time. Oh, yeah, okay. you got still got time. That's good. That's good because I don't want to take time. I want to be able to learn and listen. I mean, as we approach this election, I think it's very important to keep in mind that the corporate media has posed this as a choice between a bona fide gangster named Trump who's leading the country towards Civil War II and a bona fide militarist, Biden, who's leading the, war, leading the world toward World War III. And the question becomes, how in the God's heaven do you choose between Civil War II and World War III? It reminds me of Frederick Douglass in the 1850s. He was, he, as an abolitionist, he was asked to choose between a liberal slaveholder and a conservative slaveholder. He said, no, I want the abolition of slavery. I don't want either one of them. And he, he was part of the Liberty Party, the third party. 
Why? Because that abolitionist movement was relatively small, but it was gaining tremendous power, tremendous appeal. And it would lead toward, of course, the Republican Party under Lincoln, which has little to do right now with, the, with Trump's Republican Party. But that these are the kinds of issues we have to come to terms with. And when it comes to policy, it simply means putting poor and working people at the center of one's vision and analysis. So I'm an abolitionist when it comes to poverty. We could actually abolish poverty, $150 million, abolish it. We've got new B-21 bombers. Each one costs $2 billion. They just ordered a hundred of them, that's $200 billion of military, gone, limitless, no accountability vis-a-vis -vis the Pentagon. But when it comes to poverty, when it comes to quality education, of course, I want free education. I want free medical health care kind of thing Brother Bernie was talking about over and over again, single payer health care. When it comes to decent housing, when it comes to minimum wage, minimum wage, a few years ago, we were talking about $15 as if that was radical. I think it ought to be $27 minimum wage. I don't think anybody ought to work and still live in poverty. That ought to be a impossibility. An impossibility. Brother West, how are you gonna pay for all this? Oh, 62 cents for every dollar goes to the military. What happens when you disinvest from the 800 military units around the world and 130 special operations of U.S. forces in 130 countries? What happens when you disinvest in military and invest in people and satisfying their social needs? We've got a whole lot of money. We've spent $8 trillion on wars in the last 20 years. Can you imagine what half of that would have been in, in terms of dealing with our situation of homeless, poor children, and in the black community on the chocolate side, 37% of children live in poverty in the richest nation in the history of the world. That is spiritually sick. Where's the voices? Where's the movement? And then the grotesque wealth inequality, three individuals have wealth equivalent to 50% of U.S. population. Three persons have wealth equivalent to 160 million. That's spiritually sick. Where's the voices? 1% of the population own 90% of the wealth. Where's the voices? Well, I can hear Fannie Lou Hamer. I can hear Martin. I can hear Malcolm. I can hear Nina Simone. I know brother most desperately referring to Nina. We just had our brother die just a few days ago from the last poets who left the country and lived in Amsterdam for 25 years. I'm just talking to Felipe Luciano out of Young Lords and the young last poets too. He said, I can't live in a country that has that level of callousness toward the vulnerable. He had to leave. Now, some of y'all too young remember the last poets, but uh, I tell you, when I was coming along, last poets had it going on. Oh, those brothers were speaking some serious truth. I'll never forget them. A lot of these hip hop artists, they, they know who the last poets are because they opened the door. They were pioneers in past places. Well, you see, for me, in running for president, I always want to connect the spiritual and the social. I always want to connect the personal and the political. I always want to connect the musical and the artistic with the moral and the communal. So that we need to speak to our young people and we need to provide concrete examples to our young people of leaders who have not sold out of leaders who have not given up, become well-adjusted to injustice and well-adapted to indifference, of leaders who really care and concern. I gave one of the best lectures I gave, I, did, I, was, I presented in the last 25 years, and it was to fifth graders in Chicago, which is Rutherland Elementary School, Brother Mike, Brother, Brother Bobby Lewis. And I also taught Saturday Sunday school with my cogent brothers and sisters, Church of God in Christ. We had hundreds of them on Saturday night Sunday school, but I didn't peak that, that, that moment. My peak was with the children. And we went on extra time. And they were asking me the question, oh, sir, uh, uh, 
why are you so fired up all the time? Why do you have this energy? I was told you were old man. I was told that you are um, over 45. I said over 45. <laughs> oh, precious, precious one. 45 plus 25. Why? That's exactly right. But I try to keep my heart young. How come? Because when your heart is on fire, when your heart is true to your calling, when your heart is still listening to Curtis Mayfield and Phyllis Hyman and Gladys Knight and the Pips and Little Dramatics and the Delphonics, that you still got a flow that connects with other souls and other hearts and to the degree to which we are, can touch those young folk means we got some real potential in this campaign. Because if we can touch them, we can touch anybody among our citizenry. And if we can touch anybody among our citizenry, then we can help bring about the kind of moral awakening, spiritual renaissance and efflorescence of political courage that is required. And it is a revolution. It is a sharing of power, a sharing of resources, a sharing that takes place. It is a redistribution of wealth downward and that requires a sharing of power so i don't i don't sh I, I don't I, I don't try to uh, hold at arm's length to call for revolution that i view myself as a revolutionary in that tradition and to be able to, to have a platform and to be able to bring this to the country at this moment to be head of the american empire in order to dismantle the empire to be in the White House, not going there until everyone has a house. To be explicit about just how deep and vicious the white supremacist legacy is so that the notion that a black baby doesn't have the same value as a white baby or a Palestinian baby doesn't have the same value as an Israeli baby or an Ethiopian baby doesn't have the same value as any other baby. Yes, that is the language that is precisely the vision. Very simple, but it has subversive implications. Because if you really believe that, then it's hard, brother Abbas, to watch those pictures, man. And yet you have to, because you have to be able to respond and be part as serious acts of solidarity, be part of collective voices, collective movements. There's a wonderful love. Uh, pilgrimage taking place that I'm going to be joining uh, next week, led by Reverend Stephen Green here at AME, uh, he's a pastor at AME Church, actually was a student of mine here at, at, uh, at Union Seminary. And they're marching from Philadelphia to the White House, primarily Black preachers, trying to get the Black church to wake up, trying to get the Black church to find its moral compass once again and straighten its back, you see. So you begin to bring more voices together. He already brought some wonderful black preachers up there in the UN a couple of months ago, but it's becoming more and more pronounced and it's a beautiful thing to see him. And of course, we've seen this among our young Jewish brothers and sisters, if not now, Jewish voices for peace. Uh, we've seen it more and more among our Latino brothers and sisters. Our indigenous brothers and sisters have been strong in their voices, though a lot of times not as visible in the mainstream. Uh, uh, so I, I'm just so glad that I, I could be one voice among others in this national woke, national awaking, national coming together and gathering that we have. And I just invite each and every one of you to get on board this love train, get on board this justice train, get on board this truth train. And I don't believe that any of us have a monopoly on the truth, a monopoly on love, a monopoly on justice but we can be in quest of it. And we stronger when we are together. There's no doubt about that. So maybe I should start, stop there, my dear brother. I appreciate that, Dr. West, for your you know inspirational words and always giving us the courage. I think more than anything, your one voice has given courage to a lot of us to speak up. And 
challenge the system. You know, for many of us, especially as people that perhaps as a, as a young community, uh, when it comes to the Muslim community in the United States, there's a struggle to even have that courage and to see somebody out there on a regular basis give us the courage to talk about Palestine at a time when it wasn't popular. Uh, it opens a lot of doors. Uh, we are in, in the month of February. We are in Black History Month, and we do want to spend some time learning from the legacy of the great people within our community and have a discussion about it. So today we have a panel of great speakers, and I'd like to first uh, invite up our first panelist, Dr. Jihad Safir, the uh, president of Isla LA, Isla Academy. He runs an institution in South Los Angeles. He's part of a tradition, a family uh, that has been within the inner city for, for many years serving and building community. Uh, with that, is, uh, is, he, is he here, Dr. Imam Jihad? There you go. Floor is yours, sir. Okay. Dr. Bass, how you got you gotta tell me how much time I have. Brother, you just go uh, with the spirit. You go with the spirit. No, 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 you know, you follow, you follow brother Bass, though. You follow brother. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna we're gonna uh, go for about you know five to seven minutes and and just to talk and then we're going to the conversation after each of the speaker presents. So. Okay, okay, all right. So, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. With the name of God, the entirely merciful, the especially merciful. Um, you know, I want to first of all say it, it's uh, a privilege. I was with uh, Dr. West maybe a couple of days ago in Houston, and um, we were at the program. Then I ran into you at the airport. Yeah. And, oh, uh, yeah. So, yes, indeed, indeed. Yeah. Yes, indeed, indeed. God bless you, brother. <laughs> Blessing to see you. Yeah. So, no, it, it, it's definitely, um, you know, a blessing to be here on this particular uh, uh, program. You know, I, I want to say, you know, for myself, you know, I'm very privileged to um, have individuals who have raised me that have always been on the front lines. You know, I've always, I've been privileged to see, um, you know, a beautiful tradition of uh, what it meant to be Muslim, what it means to be Muslim, what it continues to mean to be Muslim right here in the inner city. So I'm currently, I'm an imam in South Los Angeles uh, on uh, Crenshaw and Slauson uh, in the thick of things. Um, <laughs> but it's a very beautiful experience. And, you know, I, I look at it as always an opportunity uh, for myself. Um, you know, I don't, I, I look at faith has to travel outside of the buildings uh, it has to travel outside of the four walls of the of our facility and go into the neighborhood it has to benefit the community um the tradition of islam within the inner city you know i grew up in a in a time uh where you know you had the prevalence of uh gang violence um i'll never forget you know um being asked the question on several occasions uh, where are you from? And that doesn't mean your place of origin. That means your neighborhood. And I had the privilege of being able to tell people I'm Muslim. And uh, what that meant is that people have, um, they have, uh, you know, social clout. They have done enough in the neighborhood to have the reputation that is off limits um, to because of the beautiful deeds of helping and being there for people, of being peacemakers in the community, that uh, the Muslim life hopefully, um, you know, remains off limits at least in the uh, in the inner city. You know, because of the work of my uncles and and aunties, and um, you know, so the the tradition. I just want to just take it back um, in regards to just reminding us. Um, of the Muslim, you know, footprint right, right here in the United States of, of America. And I would definitely say that Muslims have always been here. Um, those who were victimized by uh, this brutal, vicious institution of uh, chattel slavery, 
Uh, many of them, uh, you know, were Muslim. Some say up to, you know, 30 percent. Um, they're being removed from lands in which Islam was well established. You have, you know, for example, the historian Al-Bakri, um, when he was able to experience um, Islam in West Africa in Ghana in the 11th century, he mentioned that there were, he, he was able to encounter 12 mosques that had also imams and prayer callers. Um, another, uh, Ibn Battuta, he visited Mali in the 14th century, and he was amazed. At that time, Islam had been in um, you know, West Africa for 300 years. Uh, so people were uh, removed from um, West Africa. They perhaps had no idea that they were bringing over uh, Muslims. And, you know, at one point, Islam, uh, uh, you know, as what they thought, it disappeared. No, the seed had already been planted. The seed already been planted, and it was waiting for um, the right conditions in order to uh, to sprout. Um, so you had, for example, in the 30s, um, even a little bit before that, you have the uh, more science temple of America. Um, the Islam and the belief system doesn't uh, exactly resemble. Um, you know, our belief system in this day and time, but these are the fathers and our mothers who were standing on their shoulders. My my father, he came in through, uh, I have uncles that came in through the Moore Science Temple of America. Um, and my father, he came in through the Nation of Islam. And uh, he was under Elijah Muhammad. And of course, he would make a transition into a mainstream body of Muslims in uh, 1975. Uh, however, uh, the beautiful tradition of just, you know, what they would term black religion um, was very helpful in regards to setting uh, the path that we are on right now. I, I, can't, I can't separate my Islam from feeding people, right? I can't separate my Islam from bringing peace in between uh, individuals who may have a conflict in the neighborhood. Um, I can't just pray in a building and forget about the person who is in need outside of the building. Um, I don't want people in the neighborhood looking at the mosque as something that is mysterious and we have no idea what's taking place. So we get outside in the community and we serve the people. And in this day and time, uh, we know that it's important we have to serve the people. And also, I can't separate Islam from uh, what Malcolm X bought in regards to his internationalism, um, him making sure that there was no um, um, there was no division between the people who were oppressed, say, um, in the Congo and the people who were oppressed in America, right? Um, the same people who are occupying people in other parts of the world. Also, we have people right in our neighborhoods, in the hoods, who are also experiencing occupation, right? So with, with I hear Dr. Cornell West and also the people, as we he's mentioning the Malcolms, the Mal Martins, right? Uh, he's he's mentioning the Nina Simones and, and those who understood that if people are oppressed in Palestine, right, our hearts hurt, our hearts must feel it, right? We can't just only be concerned with the people who we see, who we are able to touch and feel, who we are, who look like us, no. If a human being is hurting in any part of the world, we should be concerned. We look at the, the people in, in, in Palestine right now and what they're going through, this uh, uh, brutal genocide. We should all be concerned. This should all connect to our humanity. And then also in the Congo, uh, the people, what they're going through in Sudan, um, and this is the type of Islam that I was fortunate uh, to be a student of 
as uh, the son of my father and also the nephew of my uncles and aunties who were Muslims, but they always were concerned is the faith traveling outside of this building that our prayer must extend to supporting the oppressed all around the world. So I'm grateful to be a part of this, this panel. And I would definitely say that, um, you know, if our choices now, like Dr. West said, is either civil war or world war, I don't want none of those choices. You know, um, we want the peacemakers. We want the people who are bringing peace. And it's definitely, you know, we're grateful for uh, Dr. Cornell West. And I'm I'm grateful to be a part of this, this panel. And uh, definitely, um, I would definitely say you have our, our support. And uh, may God uh, bless all of, uh, of you all. May God uh, bring peace to the people of Palestine and to the oppressed people all around the world. May God bless you all. Thank you. Amen, Jeff. Wonderful, bro. Wonderful, bro. Appreciate your wisdom and sharing your insights on your upbringing, your community, and your history. Uh, next, I'd like to invite up uh, Dr. Imad Rahim to share a little bit about his story and his background coming as a survivor of the Cambodian genocide, uh, coming to the United States, becoming an award-winning academic, and uh, really being uh, an example uh, of somebody who can really uh, build their life back up together. Dr. Rahim? Hey, good evening, everybody. Uh, first off, thank you so much uh, for allowing me to be a part of this amazing panel um, and, and be amongst these scholars and these activists, uh, community leaders. Um, so my name is Dr. Imad Rahim, but I was born Visna on. I was actually born in a concentration camp in the killing fields of Cambodia. Uh, the day that I was born, my father was being tortured and eventually executed. I had an older brother that died of starvation and illness in my mother's arms. Right. Uh, we eventually were able to escape the concentration camp and made our way to Thailand, where we spent two more years in a refugee camp. And I think sometimes we have this idea that refugee camps, you know, is this you know, a uh, place that 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 creates a level of security, right? A level of safety. Uh, but I can tell you from uh, the stories of my mother that the refugee camp that we were in was almost as bad as the concentration camp, right? Uh, people were being taken advantage of. Uh, men would leave for work and never come back. Children and women would disappear in the middle of the night, and. It took us, like I said, another two years of living in this in this uh, refugee camp until we were sponsored to come to America, right? And and I think that's the you know the idea that that we promote that we sell, you know, like like we get this ticket and we come to America and everything everything comes out perfect, right? This is the solution, this is the answer. Um, but we, you know, when it comes to the refugee story, we don't get place, you know, in in, in, you know, in, in the suburbs, right? We don't get placed in middle-class communities. My family got placed in Brooklyn, New York in the eighties, right? This is like, this is Brooklyn, New York before there were co-ops, right? This was, you know, the, uh, uh, you know, Beyonce and Jay-Z didn't have a condo in the Brooklyn I grew up in, right? This is Sunset Park, Brooklyn in the eighties when, when the Latin Kings basically controlled the territories. Uh, I grew up amongst Haitians, Dominicans, Puerto Ricans. Um, and, and while we were divided based on, uh, you know, language, uh, uh, ethnicity, culture, uh, often they came together because there was a sense of community, right? And I remember being a kid uh, at uh, 61st Street where I lived uh, during the summertime, the YMCA used to come down and shut down the block and we had this amazing block party, right? And this is like, you know, it's like a Spike Lee movie. Like this is the one thing that every kid waited for when the when when the when the block party comes out and all of a sudden the 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 um the basketball courts come out, right? Kids are playing hopscotch. And my favorite thing was when the fire hydrants turn on, right? And that was like the best experience ever. And this one one day uh during this block party, everything changed. You know, a fight broke out. 
uh, and a gun was pulled, and I happened to get get shot walking the crossfire, right? And I almost lost my leg. But this same community that had these language barriers, had these cultural differences, and sometimes were at odds, all of a sudden came together to save my life, right? So you had Puerto Ricans, Dominicans, Haitians, you know, all of these community members that were fighting to save my life, right? This this Cambodian kid that they didn't know that they they know that they only know that this that that their job that day was to save my life, right? Um, you know, and eventually I, you know, we we made our way to Syracuse, New York, because Brooklyn was not a place that my mother felt that we would survive. And we ended up in Syracuse, New York, was which was even more segregated, but instead of by boroughs, we were segregated by neighborhoods. We were now segregated by Little Italy. We were segregated by, you know, Irish towns. We were segregated by, uh, you know, by the police and all these other barriers, right? Um, but one thing that I've noticed in these communities, um, at least amongst the Black community, was the Muslims. Like the Muslims stood out, right? The Muslims were up in front um, in regards to providing services. Uh, uh, providing uh, food pantries, uh, providing clothing and school, you know, and school supplies, and and those things intrigued me, right? Those things uh, got me curious, right? And I remember being this kid out of high school, and I went to the local bodega, right? And I was trying to get something to eat, and I noticed the place was empty. At least I assumed the place was empty. Um, I looked around, couldn't find the cashier couldn't find anybody. And in my head, I was thinking I could just steal, or I could just take this bag of chip. I could take, you know, this juice and just run out. And then I heard someone said, I mean, and behind the counter, the owner of the store was actually praying. And I was learning about Islam, uh, but I was not knee deep into it yet. But something told me to just go pray with him. I had no idea technically how to pray. I just followed along with him, right? I just got behind him and just followed exactly what he was doing. And when he finished praying, he turned around and was like, who the heck, you know, who the heck is this guy? Right? He <laughs> jumped right behind the counter and started praying behind me. So he was like, hey, I, you know, salam alaikum. I was like, alaikum salam. He's like, are you Muslim? I was like, no. <laughs> right? So he goes, uh, yeah, so what made you pray? And I said, you know, something told me, uh, you know, that I should pray, that I need to pray, right? Um, so I started uh, finishing school. And every time I finished school, I would just go straight to the bodega and learn about Islam with him until eventually he's like, you already take Shahada. And then when I took my Shahada with him, and he was a Palestinian brother, uh, I came home and I was trying to figure out how can I tell my mother that I converted into Islam, right? And I was trying to figure out like, what should I say? How should I say it? And then finally I did, she listened, she nodded ahead a few times. And then she goes, yeah, you, you know, you didn't have to take your Shahada. You know, we're already Muslims. And I was like, what? <laughs> what? What do you mean we're Muslims? Right, like, like we never talked about this. We never prayed. We don't have no Quran in the house. What do you mean we're Muslims? And she goes, no, we're ethnically Muslims. She's like, don't you realize that you're Muslim because we never ate pork? And I was like, I just thought we didn't like pork, right? I just like, right? And she goes, um, you know, she goes, you back back home in Cambodia, your family's Muslim. Um, we were being slaughtered, right, during during the the war in Cambodia. Um, so we started hiding our ethnicity. And, and when we came to America and we got involved with Catholic charities that sponsored us to come to America, we thought the, the Christian experience, we thought the Catholicism, that was part of being American, right? So back in Cambodia, religion is almost like an ethnicity. So when we came to America, she saw um, religion as being part of the American culture. Like if you wanted to be American, you should go to church, right? If you want food, you want clothing, the church gives you that, right? So, you know, so I was going to Catholic church, right? I was going to Sunday school, 
Um, but in her mind, we never left the religion. We 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 just you know uh, wanted to become more American in that sense, right? And so through that three sixty, I learned to discover who I am, my family, my background, and got even more deep into Islam. Uh, and and started really going to Brooklyn where where Mashid uh, Siraj I mean Iman Siraj Hodge is at over in Fulton over in Bed Stuy and saw the work that he was doing, um, and and just became more and more involved in social activism. So that's my story. And thank you very much for having give me the opportunity to share. Thank you, everybody. Mm, no, powerful, brother, powerful, Dr. Rahim. Um, our next uh, panelist uh, is. Brother Thabri Zahir, who has uh, experience as a ther as a therapist currently, but has experience working as an educator and working with people that have been formerly incarcerated, and also now working with people on addiction. Uh, he's going to speak to a little bit about his story and also the importance of self refinement in a community. You're on mute, Thabri. Bismillah, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Uh, so, oh, you see? Yes, all right. Wow, that was powerful. Like, how do I follow that up? You know? <laughs> how do I follow that up? Um, so, I know we're probably, looks like we're running behind. So, I'm going to try to speed it up a little bit. Um, number one, I'm going to say that probably the most um, important factor that informs my work, which I'll talk about in a second, is uh, that my great-grandfather was one of the survivors of Greenwood, which is one of the suburbs of Tulsa, Oklahoma in 1921, uh, when over 300 um, African-Americans were killed in that suburb uh, due to a race riot. And from that, my family, you know, my, my, my great grandfather uh, re relocated to Los Angeles. And uh, so here we are. Um, my father embraced Islam in uh, the late 1960s or the early 1970s. And um, I've been hearing about, you know, social work, social services, human service uh, my entire life. <clears throat> so professionally, yes, I am a therapist. Um, and I work with you know a lot of people, especially the youth. I'm also a chaplain at UCLA. Um, I'm a regular imam, you know, around Southern California, giving sermons all over SoCal. Um, I'm a counselor, an advisor, a mentor of the youth, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, as far as you know, just a lot of the work um, that I see is is helping community and. Um, you know, trying to unite the community. So I want you all to think, number one, um, about a basketball team or a football team. And I want you to ask yourself, what if the players never did their own work? We want people to come together as a team, but it is the responsibility of every individual to do a certain amount of work on their own. So first and foremost, there must be leadership, like uh, Dr. West very uh, brilliantly explained to us, there must be leadership. And they have to be committed to the work of building community, helping community under those values of truth, justice, and compassion, chosen by the wisest of us, and then we have to follow their lead. So what's in our hearts? You know, everything that we see out in the world, it comes from a human heart, whether it's good or bad, comes from a human heart. And each one of those hearts, the building of those hearts, whether good or bad, it starts in the family. Our caregivers, they give us ideals and we carry that into the world. We carry that into our communities. So just a few things I want to say. Number one, we have to all ask ourselves, I mean, because we're, you know, here we are, you know, uh, Muslim visionaries, you know, we're trying to build community. We're trying to have political power in, in, in this community. So if we're going to do this, we have to always ask ourselves, what are we willing to sacrifice? 
What, what are we going to, what are we, what are you willing to sacrifice? Because those before us, as Dr. West mentioned, you know, Bell Hooks and Martin Luther King and Malcolm X, et cetera, et cetera, the people that Imam Jihad that he mentioned, they sacrificed something. Are we willing to sacrifice Netflix, Hulu, Amazon? Like, what are we willing to sacrifice? You know, and 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 if we're going to strive in the community, if we're going to add value to our community, then we have to be engaged in like spiritual struggle. You have to have like a private regimen that is consistent and is rigorous to be able to offset, you know, spiritual inertia. And the reason why I'm saying that is because if your spiritual program is inconsistent, then your public work will also be inconsistent and ineffective. When you come into contact with a lot of people on a consistent basis, you know, it, it, it pulls on you. It, 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 it can drain you. And you have to be consistently adding back to that reservoir. So there's two things that's going to happen. And I bear witness to this. The ego is going to be tested. Right, your ego is going to be tested. You know, everybody's not going to agree with you. Everybody's not going to see the big picture. Your ego is going to be tested, and you might run out of strength to deal with the continuous mischief. So you have to have like some type of rigorous spiritual program. And lastly, I would like to say that, you know, one of the pitfalls of the time that we're living in right now is that. I, you know, I see that the biggest, greatest distraction to doing this spiritual work is that we are working on the perception of ourselves instead of actually working on ourselves, right? And I, and I can say this, you know, I, I, I see at least 30 people a week, you know, and, and, and you know, the job of the therapist is, is to help, you know, individuals see their true selves, right? We're just like, hold, you're holding up a mirror, you know, you're in, and you're trying to help them to see themselves. They, they have to become comfortable with themselves. They have to know the truth about themselves if they're going to change. All right. We want to help them to no longer be prisoners of their childhood, of their trauma, you know, of, of any abuse, et cetera, et cetera. But we have to actually do the work. We have to work on ourselves instead of the perception of ourselves. I would like to end by just saying, you know, I'm very, very grateful to for, for Dr. West. I was at your presentation uh, that you had when you were here in Southern California. I was very impressed. And like uh, Imam Jihad said, yes, we do support you. We we definitely support you. Mm -hmm. um, I had the honor of reading your book, Race Matters, um, a long, long time ago. And, um, you know, one of the things that really got me thinking was your analysis of of of, of Malcolm X. You know, you started asking questions about, um, you know, it was, it was there were questions you were asking about uh, Malcolm X that like I had never considered. And it just gave me and I never forgot that, you know, and then I really, really appreciate you uh, for that. I'm sure you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, I would like to thank uh, Muslim visionaries, you know, Dr. Baz and, and Malik and, you know, everybody that's, you know, supporting this because, um, you know, this is something that's been talked about for a long time you know, about, you know, getting politically active uh, and, and, and finally somebody's stepping up to the plate, stepping up to the plate to do it. And there's a lot of work to be done. And I hope that we can all continue to support this. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum. Oh, wonderful. Wonderful, my brother. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you so much to all the presenters and all the people that shared their wisdom. Uh, we have a little bit of time. I don't know, too, not too much time to get into the panel discussion. But we do have a couple of key questions that's on everyone's mind on, um, you know, politics, community and all of that. So the first question, and I'll open the floor to any one of the panel notices, is where can our community begin to build power outside of the political system? I think one of the challenges that we're facing right now is that we have this two-party system, the Democrats, the Republican, and people feel like to build power, they have to get onto a committee in the DNC or the RNC and they got to climb their ladder up. But what is power and how do you start building it uh, within a community? So I, I can um, add some context and some examples to that. Um, so in the last few years, 
um, well, actually for the last eight, nine years, I've been serving on multiple nonprofit boards. And obviously they do a lot of great work and provides a lot of access to supporting the community in, in a lot of meaningful ways. But me and my wife, in the last three years, we started looking at funding sources, like where where's the money coming from? Right. And who controls the money in regards to funding, you know, community centers, uh, after school programs, you know, the things that help the community move forward. And then we realize a lot of these large foundations, right? These, you know, you know, the foundations with someone's last name, right? The Allen Foundation, the Welch Foundation, right? And we realize these are millions of dollars, you know, that is being managed and being uh distributed in, in various uh, ways to communities, to after school programs, to charter schools and those type of things. So then we started trying to figure out, well, how can we get in on those boards, right? To make sure that we have our voice in those rooms when they decide where the money goes and how the money should be spent, right? And eventually both me and my wife ended up on three or four boards on these foundations. Mm -hmm. wow. And it's, and then, and then, and then through that work, we got more people from the community that we knew on these boards. And because of that work, we created things called the Black and Equity Grant, right? Focusing on Black businesses, right? Mm -hmm. Where millions of dollars are now being supported, not just to nonprofits, but to grassroots organizations that may not have a 501c3, Right. And we were able to do that because we started thinking outside the box where a lot of these nonprofit foundations are saying you need a 501c3. But after doing research, we said, no, they really need a pass through. Right. So if they work with a current nonprofit, a grassroots organization that does not have a 501c3 could get that money if they have a pass through. And then we started working for we started supporting small businesses that normally would not get that money by way of a pass through, right? But that requires us really thinking outside of the box, right? Because when we look at where a lot of this money goes, it goes to the same people, right? It goes to the same organization. Whether you look at New York City, LA, Atlanta, when you look at these like, you know, these uh, large, you know, uh, $500 million foundations, it's always going to the same museum. It's going to the same opera. House, right? It's going to the same, you know, big uh, mm -hmm. charter school with someone's last name on it. Um, but in order for us to really look at power and shape power in a more meaningful way, we have to follow the money, right? At least, at least that's that's what I've noticed. And and through that, we've been able to change policy, change laws, influence the the politicians, um, support grassroots movement, you know. Um, and, and I think we have to start local, right. And, and, and local really creates impact, right. And then impact can grow from local to national. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, you know, I think it's very important to connect what you, what you just said, uh, with such insight to what we've also been talking about in terms of spiritual power and moral power and artistic power, because those are the three, especially for our young folk who get them to love themselves and respect themselves and have a self regard for them such that they're able to do what you and your beloved wife are able to do. So you all already have to have a self-confidence and a self-respect and a self-regard to walk in there and then to follow through and then become part of a collective or then economic power, political power has a moral and spiritual dimension to it. I mean, one of the problems in our society is that a lot of times we think people think of power and they only think of the economic and political power and the morality and spirituality drops out. So you end up with gangsters that got a lot of economic and political power, but it's hard to discern any moral dimension going on. And this cuts across color, cuts across gender, it cuts across religion. Yeah, because I know I was a Christian. I know we got some pimps in the pulpit now. So I I, I say that in the name of Jesus. You know what I mean? <laughs> 
and, and, and this is true for, you know, all religions can be used for ill. And what's wonderful about uh, Judaism and Christianity and Islam is that it's anti-idolatrous. We were talking about this in Houston, uh, John. It's, it's anti-idolatrous, you see. I was just with a, uh, a mosque in Philadelphia with my dear brother, uh, Idris, Imam Idris, who was just a magnificent brother. And we were talking about the great Daryl uh, 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 Kareem going back to the University of Islam, 88 years old, and I had a chance to embrace him and spend that quality time with him in Houston at the gathering of Muslim just this weekend. And I could see in them this spiritual and moral power that allows them to move in the economic terrain, to move in the political terrain. And we, I think it's important to always connect those because a lot of times power gets reduced just to just the economic and uh, the economy and, uh, and politics. Um, thank you, Dr. West. I, 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 yeah, you just gave us some, uh, some wisdom. I would like to say this before we go to the next question. Um, I, you know, I'm a chaplain on UCLA, and I see how um, the private sector is very, very powerful, okay? And I also see that the Muslims have not partaken, they, have, they don't have their fair share of influencing the private sector. What I mean by the private sector, how many Muslim films are out there? you know, in any capacity, whether we're teaching people about the, our faith, whether we're teaching people about some of the economic problems around the around the country, uh, you know, how Islam, you know, can be hijacked or like media in now is power. It's power. And if we don't have our own film, you know, making uh, ventures, uh, we're way, way, way behind the the, the eight ball. Universities are funded. Many, many universities are funded by the private sector. Mm -hmm. Hospitals, clinics, food distribution, you know. Um, and so I, I think we have to have more people that are concerned about being part of the private sector in, at high positions. You know, like I said, I see how things are at UCLA and I, and it, I just I understand, you know, like we, we have to catch up. Dr. Imad, I would like to say, I did not know that you were part of that Black Equity Grant. Uh, my organization was a recipient of one of those grants. So, mm, you know, I, I didn't know that. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. thank you. Thank you very much. Dude. Thank you very much. I, I, I want to add, you know, uh, the importance of education. You know, we'll be surprised. Um, especially, you know, uh, those who are challenged, uh, you know, um, especially regarding uh, social uh, economic status, um, the misinformation that they may be receiving um, in regards to politics and political economy, all anything surrounding politics, there's a lot of misinformation and a lot of ignorance. Um, so I think education is essential. There was at one point, I know um, in the Muslim community, in particular the African-American Muslim community, there was a, you know, there was a debate on do we engage politically or not? Um, uh, do, we, do we vote or not? Um, and we would be surprised as th this conversation is still taking place. And I think a lot of it is based off of, uh, you know, ignorance. You know, a lot of it is based off of uh, mis misinformation and um, not having access to those who have an expertise in the political sector. So I think it's important. Education is important. Education is essential. And the other, we have a lot of people suffering from, you know, um, in regards to miseducation, they're getting conspiracy theories and, and so on and so forth, uh, things that you cannot, uh, that you can't prove and it leads to this sort of powerlessness, this apathy and powerlessness that I will never be able to change the system uh, with my vote. My vote doesn't even count. Um, I've heard things like the the president is uh, is uh, you know selected, not elected. 
you know, um, so there's there's a lot of uh, misinformation um, which leads to people uh, not doing anything, not engaging the uh, political system uh, at, at all. And on the other hand, there's a lot of people um, that perhaps have entered into just uh, negative psychological states from their current situation, whether it's poverty, um, whether it's they don't even uh, because life is is so personalized, um, they're not really in touch with the uh, community, no strong communal ties that they're they they are dealing with their personal day to day. I don't have time to to vote. I don't have time to listen to this politician. I don't have time to engage the system because I'm trying to pay rent. You know, I'm trying to I'm dealing with. Uh, my personal family issues and so on and so forth. So um, there's a there's a lot of things that may become barriers, um, and I would definitely say the uh, this thing of um, uh, uh, misinformation, miseducation. We need more education, and we need more community. Education and community, I think, are the essential uh, uh, keys. I need, I think, to getting people more engaged in politics. Thank you, everyone, for that, for those beautiful answers on, on building power. My last question for the evening, and I think it ties into what Imamji had just mentioned, um, you know, this idea that uh, it's too big, we can't change, the system is too gigantic, my vote doesn't count. But there's also an element of building and having a vision, but building piece by piece. And I think what happens is a lot of people get demotivated when they see this gigantic vision of what should happen, and they don't see that reality happening. So my question is, how can we keep people motivated for the long-term goals? Understand that there's going to be a vision, but they have to work through the process. And many people, they get defeated in the process. They get uh, distracted. There's uh, a lot of people that exploit people's emotions. And, you know, I think just, uh, just one example is a couple of years ago, Muslims were fed up with Trump. He, got, he has the Muslim ban. We're done with him. He is the greatest enemy. We need to go all in on Biden. And Biden is our guy. And then now we see Biden or like now we have genocide Joe and then we're all fighting genocide Joe abandoned Biden. But then like we're running from one reaction to the next reaction, waiting for the next cycle. And we're we're not even focused on building, uh, thinking long term what we what our community needs. Hmm. <clears throat> anyone anyone want to take that question first? <laughs> How do you keep people motivated for the long term? We we need trustworthy politicians. You know, people. I think we're walking around heartbroken. You know, um, you know, we 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 thought. I'm not gonna say we. I'm not. I, I don't want to generalize it, but at least I thought um, uh, Barack Obama. You know, was gonna bring. And I and I thought I thought. Others, and you know, they it's been very disappointing. It's been a, a disappointing, a journey full of disappointments. Um, so I think it's time for individuals to um, you know to rise up and be individuals of truth, and um, you know, not uh, individuals who you know break the hearts of the people again. You know, our hearts are we've grown callous. You know, and we don't trust anymore, you know, because of what has taken place, um, you know, all throughout America's history. You know, this mistrust and distrust, I mean, it's it's, uh, it's led us to this feeling of powerlessness. So we need people we can, we can definitely uh, trust. Yeah, see, I, I, I think that, it, <clears throat> again, I speak from a very personal point of view that, um, See, I have a trust in God that is qualitatively different than any kind of confidence in other human beings. Now, I have great confidence, you know, in my wife and my brother and sister and mama, but she gone, daddy, but she gone. And so that confidence is there. But the trust in the end is something so much bigger than me that uh, no matter what people do, even one of my strong critiques of Obama and so forth, that 
that I was never discouraged when Obama betrayed poor people when he opted for Wall Street vis-a-vis everyday people, when he dropped drones in Libya and Somalia and Pakistan and so forth. I wasn't discouraged. I just had to point it out, but keep my fire. I had to give my critique, but keep my witness because my calling is something that the world didn't give me and the world can't take away. Now, People say, well, that's Christian or that's Muslim or that's Judaic or that's Buddhist. But no, you can be a secular person to say that there is a freedom that you're tied to. There is a quality that you're tied to that's not manifest in the world as much as you like. So this is bigger than anybody else. And so no matter how many times people betray you, you still have a calling that that's something that's bigger than you. I mean, for me, it's God. It mediated with Jesus and so forth, my precious Muslim brothers and sisters, to bring in Moses and Jesus and Muhammad and, and so forth. But I think it's very important that people don't view any politician or leader as Messiah hmm. or as having some messianic magic, messianic power, but, but they can be trustworthy. So I'm agreeing with you though, we want God. They can be trustworthy. We don't need leaders that just keep betraying us all the time. But in the end, you know, hope is uh, it's a virtue, it's a discipline, it's a verb, and it's motion. So as long as you are in motion with community leaders, in motion with your family, in motion with your neighborhood, in motion with your musical group, in motion in your synagogue, in your temple, in your church, in your trade union, as long as you're in motion, you got hope because hope and action go hand in hand. They go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. And as long as you're in motion, then you never can really be uh, 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 fatalistic or cynical or nihilistic or feeling as if nothing matters or nothing can change. And I think that's important because when you look up at all of the evils and all of the systems of domination, you can be overwhelmed. You can be deeply overwhelmed. But as long as you're in motion every day, every week, every year, and beginning, and you can see certain kinds of uh, changes, even though they're very small, then I think you're able to. Uh, hope for those big moments and this is what the campaign is the campaign we want this to be a, a big moment in which all of the smaller motions can, can come together into a movement and then the powers that be have to take notice and in the end we make our way all the way to the white house now i know that's going to surprise a lot of people but we won't get into that right now but we're going to surprise a whole lot of people i can tell you that right now Oh, we're going we're gonna to surprise some folk. Very much so. Thank you, Dr. West. Uh, uh, Arbaz, this is what I would say. I would say that, uh, number one, you know, the, 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 the Muslim community is still maturing in America. And I think it's just like, you know, like a, it's, like, it's like raising a child. You have to give them small victories, right? And you have to constantly... Uh, you know, keep reinforcing those small victories until they have enough self-esteem um, to, you know, take on big tasks. So, um, the, the, I, you know, I would ask you a question. I would say, how fast can you reproduce Muslim visionaries, <laughs> right? Because <laughs> that, that is, that's what we're going to need all over the country, Right. We're going to need, you know, because I'm, I, 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 I get your text messages. I, I, I see the work that you're doing. You're trying to get people to participate at the local level. But here we have somebody on, on the platform right now, you know, who's at the federal level, um, you know, and it's, it's beautiful. Right. It's beautiful. And so you're 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 you've taken on both tasks, you know. And so, you know, I think, you know, just small victories, you know, showing people. Uh, you know how this is how you talk to your elected officials um, in your lo in your local neighborhood. This is how you talk to the council members. This is how you hold the council member responsible. This is how you get a new park. This is how you get a stop sign. This is how you get a stoplight. 
when people start seeing those small victories, then they'll understand naturally that it's the same thing at a, at a, at a, at a, mm-hmm. you know, at the federal level, you know, it's the same thing, you know. Yeah. And definitely to that point, I think the small <laughs> victories are important because, you know, right now a lot of people are, have lost hope in these politicians, but I think one thing to note is the city council member that stands with you on ceasefire, the, uh, you know, the school board member, all these individuals, they're standing with us right now when it's politically risky. Now, it might not be this next election, but it might be the following election. We know who to invest our resources in because we have resources right now. We've been placing it in a lot of different directions. But now, as Dr. West mentioned earlier, it's the litmus test. We know really now where to place our resources because in our most you know troubling, darkest moments, who stood with us on it within our community and who was silent? And that and it's almost a blessing in some ways because it gives us some clarity on where we want to move forward and who's going to stand with us uh, when nobody else does. Um, Dr. Heem, I'm going to pass it to you for some for your final answer on that. No, I just want to reiterate what everybody said. I think if we put our faith and trust in men, right, we're always going to be disappointed, right, because people are flawed. But I think when we focus on the movement, right, when we focus on the 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 transformational change that we're trying to create, that's where the power exists, right? So my faith, my my passion is always on the work itself. It's not on the people that is pushing the work forward because people will change, right? Uh, people will move out of those positions, right? But the issues will still be on the table and we have to focus on the solutions, you know, to counteract the issues that we are facing, right? And figure out, you know, how to move things forward, uh, how to create transformational change. Uh, we have to think about the youth, right? Because mm-hmm. anything that we create now will impact our children and our grandchildren going forward. So I, I always say that, you know, don't focus on people, but focus on on the work at hand. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> So thank you so much to all the uh, panelists for sharing their insights and their stories. And, you know, I hope we all can uh, connect in person at some point. I have a I have a mission. I want to bring Dr. West to uh, South L.A. to spend some time with Imam Jihad. So we'll try to make that happen Ooh, at some that point. Sounds good to me. <laughs> that sounds good to me. Um, I'm of that. I hope I get a chance to meet all. I see Sister yeah. Sharon out there and Brother Hussam out there and Brother Al. I hope I get yeah. Brother before Dutch. we close so madeline do you want to yeah. madeline has some action steps for all of us so we can uh to talk about the campaign and and how they're organizing uh dr was do you want to say some closing words before we pass to madeline or madeline do you want to go into the presentation and uh, end off there no i think you can go straight to madeline i just want to say i'm blessed to be here and this was a marvelous conversation i was instructed i was inspired and I want to thank each and every one of you, all of you who've been here. 